Welcome to Today's Walk with Dr. Roger Spradlin from Valley Baptist Church, the program helping you to understand the Bible today. Welcome to Today's Walk. I'm Kate Neighbors here with Pastor Roger Spradlin. Now we have a treat message today. I love the stories of the Old Testament and you are gonna be preaching out of the Old Testament. I am, we, we're looking at one of the clearest presentations of the gospel in all the Bible. And interestingly, it is in the Old Testament. Hmm. Okay, let's jump in and watch the gospel in the Old Testament, part one. Now it's been said of the book of Isaiah that it is really in many ways the Bible in miniature. Our Bible contains 66 books. Well, there are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books that cover the history and really the sin of Israel. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah deal with the sin of both Israel and Judah. In the New Testament, there are 27 books that for the most part, they deal with the person and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. The last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah, uh, for the most part, are prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Only the book of Psalms in all of the Old Testament has more messianic promises, uh, prophecies uh, than the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was a prophet for more than 40 years. Some say, closer even to 60. He was a prophet during the reign of five different kings of Judah. Isaiah is arguably the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He was certainly the most insightful regarding the coming of the Messiah. So Isaiah was a statesman, I think, who rivaled Moses. He had the courage of an Elijah in confronting the sins of four different kings. He's on David's level as an author and perhaps even as a poet. At times, his literary ability seemed to surpass that of Milton and Homer and perhaps even Shakespeare. He was a preacher, a prophet, a statesman, a historian, a poet. But of all of his writings, in my opinion, Isaiah 53 is the high water mark. It is perhaps the greatest chapter of the Old Testament. It's alluded to or quoted in the New Testament more than any other chapter from the Old Testament. I think it's the greatest chapter in the Old Testament regarding the coming of the Messiah. And yet it was written against the darkness of heathenism under the shadow really of superstition. It's all about Jesus though. And yet it was written some 700 years before the birth of Christ. It reads a lot like a New Testament uh, uh, chapter. Now the people of Isaiah's time, they were longing for the coming of a Messiah. The word Messiah means anointed one, but they understood it in the sense of a deliverer. In the second half of the book of Isaiah, he envisions this time in the future where the people of God would be captives. They would be living in exile. Jerusalem would be destroyed and the people would become slaves and they would be waiting, waiting for a deliverer. And he writes about that time and the coming of a Messiah. Now later as the people of God read it, it really gave them tremendous hope. But I guess in some ways the big question of Isaiah's time is what would the Messiah be like? There were at least three different views or schools of thought regarding the coming of the Messiah. One school of thought said when the Messiah comes, he will be a political leader. He will gain political uh, influence and he will be the ultimate diplomat that uh, strikes a deal. Uh, earlier, they thought, well, the deal would be made with the Assyrians. That was their enemy. Later, they thought, well, when the Messiah comes, he will make a deal with the Babylonians because that was their enemies. And later it was with the the, the Persians and so forth. Others thought when the Messiah comes, he's going to be a military man. He will build a coalition and he will lead an insurrection and he will conquer by sword or by conquest. The third view was there were some people thought when the Messiah comes, he will be this supernatural transcendent being that has the power of miracles. He, he, he will right all wrongs. He'll bring retribution against the wicked and reward 
uh, the righteous. Well, Isaiah presents a fourth view. He said that when the Messiah comes, he will suffer and he will die as a sacrifice for people's sin. Now, as we look back from our perspective on the Old Testament era, we, we tend to wonder, why were there so many different opinions about the coming of the Messiah? They're reading the same prophecies. They're serving the same God. Well, there are many, many prophecies throughout the Old Testament that, that said that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be ruling and reigning. So people thought, well, surely he's a political leader. Maybe he's, a, he's going to be a king or a military man of conquest. They did not understand what we now know, that the Messiah would come twice, that he would come the first time, as Isaiah predicted, to suffer and die for his sins, but that he will come the second time to rule and reign as a king upon the earth. Isaiah 53 presents the gospel. Now, the word gospel simply means good news. For Isaiah, it was the good news of the coming of the Messiah. So here's the first principle from Isaiah regarding the Messiah. It is this. The Messiah will be God incarnate upon the earth. Now, the word incarnation, I recognize as a theological word. Not, I try my best to avoid real churchy or theological words, but I think this is an important word for us to really understand. I, I tend to think of it this way, incarnation in carcass, meaning in flesh, that, that God who is spirit will come to the earth as a man. And Isaiah envisioned that time. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. We'll read the rest of the verse in a moment. He speaks of the arm of the Lord. That's the physicality of the Messiah. And then it says he shall grow up as a tender shoot or a tender uh, plant. Now Isaiah is using here a very unusual grammatic construction, a structure that we don't even have in English. It's called the prophetic future. He uses the past tense. You would think we would translate it that uh, he grew up as a tender plant, but it's a prophetic future. In other words, the prophet Isaiah was so convinced that the Messiah would come as he predicted that he uses a past tense to describe a future event. We don't even have anything like that in English. It, it would be improper grammatically for us to use that kind of construct in English. It says he shall grow up as a tender plant, literally as a shoot, a root, he says, out of dry ground. He will grow. In other words, the Messiah's not going to come as a full grown man. He won't come on the scene as a general or a political leader uh, that burst on the scene. He will come as a child that grows. Sounds a lot like Bethlehem of the New Testament where Jesus was born. He, he says, Isaiah says, he will be a tender shoot. Now, if you walk through the forest, let's say, and you come across a stump where a tree has been chopped down and there's just a stump left, sometimes you will see a uh, one little sucker shoot coming out of the stump. The stump that Isaiah is describing for us uh, was the empire of Israel under David. David united all the tribes of Israel from north to south in one united empire, and he ruled over them. And then Solomon, his son, ruled over the united empire. After Solomon's death, the country uh, went through a horrible civil war, and it was torn in two. The nation in the north uh, became known as Israel. And they were eventually destroyed by the Assyrians. The nation in the south became known as Judah. And they were destroyed by the Babylonians, although they eventually came back into the land. Yet we have so many prophecies in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come through the kingdom of David. But by Jesus' time, there was no kingdom of David upon the earth. There was no united empire. There was Judah, but, but Israel was, was gone really as a country. It was like the, the united empire was like a desert and it was like a tree that had been chopped down and there was just a stump. And yet there was this tender shoot that came out of the stump. Now let's flash ahead into New Testament thinking. The New Testament begins 
in a rather inauspicious way when you think about it. It begins in Matthew by saying so-and-so begat so-and-so, they begat so-and-so, and it's a, it's a genealogy. And you read that and you think, why would you begin a book with genealogy? What could be more boring than that? But Matthew is showing us that Jesus traced his lineage back to David, that the empire that had been cut off and it was now like a tree that had been chopped down, it was just a stump that Jesus was that tender shoot coming out of the lineage of David. Because the Old Testament said, when the Messiah comes, he will be of the lineage of David. And so Matthew goes to great lengths in the beginning of the New Testament to show that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy of Isaiah of being this tender shoot. Now, look with me at the end of verse number two. It says he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Here's the principle. The Messiah, Isaiah is saying, will be rejected by men. Now, at least one group of people in their thinking thought when the Messiah comes, he will be this supernatural transcendent being that has the power of uh, signs and wonders and that they were thinking, well, when that happens, everyone's going to automatically follow the Messiah. Others said, no, he's going to be a charismatic political leader and he's going to unite all the people. And others said, no, he's going to be this great general, a military genius to build a coalition and everyone's going to follow him. But Isaiah said, when the Messiah come, he's go comes, he's going to be a very ordinary man as far as his appearance. He's not going to be comely. Literally, he's not going to be handsome is the way we would translate it. He, he's not going to be charismatic. In fact, he's going to have a very lowly beginning. He's not going to be born in a palace. And we know from the New Testament that Jesus was actually born in a stable, right? Uh, now, remember, there, originally there was no chapter divisions in our, our Bible. That was added sometime later. So let's kind of back up from chapter 53 to verse chapter 52, verse 14. And Isaiah talking to the Messiah said this, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Isaiah is describing here an awful time of suffering in the life of the Messiah. Now that must have been a shock to the people of Judah at that time. Sometimes modern preachers describe the gore and the agony of crucifixion. The Bible really doesn't. But Isaiah shows us the end result of the suffering of crucifixion. It says his body will be bruised and beaten and, and it'll really be more than any other man. It'll be beyond recognition is what he says. Now look with me in Isaiah chapter 53 and Verse number three, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He, he was despised and we did not esteem. It says we hid our faces from him. The common thought of the day of Isaiah is when the Messiah comes, everyone is going to immediately follow him, whether he's a king or a military guy or a supernatural being. Everyone is going to follow the Messiah. But Isaiah says, no, he's going to be despised and he's going to be rejected by men. His claims of deity are going to be ridiculed when he's upon the earth. He's going to be held in derision. In fact, we know that was said of Jesus. They said when they found out it was from Nazareth, they said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? His words of wisdom were rejected. At the end of his life, there were false witnesses that were paraded before him in a kangaroo court. And he was crucified. He was stripped not only of his legal rights, but of even basic human rights. Now let's back up a couple chapters even earlier in the book of Isaiah, in his prophecy in chapter 50. And Isaiah puts words in the mouth of the Messiah who has not yet come. This is what the Messiah will say. Isaiah chapter 50, verse six. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. The Isaiah will say, uh, the Messiah will say, I gave my back to a beating and I, I gave my face so that they plucked my beard. Now, 
At the time that Isaiah said that, it was inconceivable to the people of Judah that the Messiah would be beaten. It was, it was just inconceivable that these words would ever be spoken by the Messiah. But we know that's what happened, that, that Jesus was severely beaten by the Romans. And we know that they pulled his beard and left little bloody puff marks. And we know that they spit in his face, the spittle from foul men's lips mingled with the blood in his beard as he died. Now, usually a man who was executed as a criminal, it was common that he would be buried in an unmarked grave so the family would be able to forget the shame of it all. But look what Isaiah says about the death of the Messiah. And this is in Isaiah 53, verse number nine. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. When Isaiah wrote that, the people were probably perplexed. How could he die with the wicked and yet be buried with the rich? Well, we know that's exactly what happened. When Jesus died, he died with a criminal being crucified, one on each side of him, and yet he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Now, when Isaiah first wrote those words, or maybe he orally preached them on the streets of Jerusalem, uh, that the Messiah will be rejected and despised. You could probably have heard people grumbling in the crowd and, and maybe finally think someone shouted, no, that's not how we're going to respond to the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, we're going to rally around him. We're going to follow him. When the Messiah comes, he's going to alleviate our suffering. He'll bring retribution against our enemies. He'll reward the righteous but not so. When the Messiah came, when Jesus came, the religious leaders were threatened. Jesus had exposed them uh, in their form of religion that was really just empty ritual. They had no heart really for God. In fact, Jesus had said of the religious leaders of his day, he said, you're like a whited sepulcher. It's all white and sparkling on the outside, but when you open, there's, there's the rottenness of dead men's bones. He says, you're keeping the external law, but inside your heart, there is rottenness. And so the religious establishment, they rejected him when he came. John said he came unto his own and his own received him not. His own nation rejected him. They wanted a political leader that would set them free. At first they thought this Messiah will come and set us free from the Assyrians. And then the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. They said, oh, the Messiah will set us free from the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians. And they said, oh, the Messiah will set us free from the Persians. And then by Jesus, Jesus' day, they said, he will, the Messiah will set us free from the Romans. And now Israel today, modern Israel says, when the Messiah comes, we'll be free from our enemies that camp and camp all around about us. What they wanted was freedom and prosperity, not forgiveness. So the general populace, they rejected him when he came. Oh, not at first. I mean, remember the stories that came out of the north and, and Galilee when he first began his public ministry and he performed so many miracles and, and the people began to follow him by the hundreds and, and, and by the thousands. Everywhere he went, he couldn't even escape the crowd. And finally, even at the end of his life, in that last week of his life, when he entered the city of Jerusalem, it was to pandemonium. The people lined the streets on that Monday by the hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And they, they, they sang a, a, an Old Testament psalm. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, a messianic psalm. But by the end of that same week, the fickle crowd chanted together, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Because it finally had dawned upon them that this man, Jesus, was no political leader, that he did not desire to be a military leader to lead an insurrection and conquest against Rome, that he was and is a spiritual leader, that he came to Jerusalem, as Isaiah had predicted, to die for our sins. Even the disciples who were the closest to him forsook him. He was a man, the by Isaiah said, of sorrows acquainted with grief. Imagining the suffering of holy God, living as a human in the vile streets of our world. 
Jesus was constantly moved with the needs of people all around about him. There, there, there were the leper camps, the blind, the lame. He saw the spiritual blindness of people's hearts like no one had ever seen it before. All the people could see was the law of God. They knew nothing of the love of God. To them, it was all about rules and nothing about a relationship with a living God. And he saw all that and it absolutely broke his heart. Isaiah predicted it. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of his, our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Here's the principle. The Messiah, Isaiah is saying, came to suffer for our sin. The message of the Bible is not just that Jesus died. Everyone dies. The message of the Bible is that Jesus died for our sins. That's the good news of the gospel. At the end of verse number five, it says, by his stripes, we are healed. Now, there's a significant segment of Christianity today that says that means that physical healing is part of the atonement. It's part of our salvation. That if a believer is sick, all you have to do is name that illness and claim your healing because it's your right now as a believer. The reality is God does heal people on occasion physically. He does that in response to our prayer, but he doesn't heal everyone. And he certainly doesn't heal every believer because healing belongs to the sovereignty of God. It is not part of the atonement, at least not for now. There are three parts of, of salvation. There's first of all, justification, we're made right with God. And then there's sanctification, this process of a lifetime where we become more and more like Jesus. And then ultimately there is what we call glorification, where after death, we're made completely like Jesus and we receive this glorified body and we're beyond the reach of sin and even of temptation. And in that glorification, there is certainly physical health for eternity, but not now. Let me remind you of the context of Isaiah's prophecy. We see it in the very beginning. He tells us in Isaiah chapter one, verse six, he says, from the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed nor bound up or soothed with ointment. He begins the book by saying there's a spiritual sickness in humanity. It's a metaphor. He describes these sores, but he's describing the world spiritually. And then he reaches the apex of his book, which I think is Isaiah 53, and says when the Messiah comes, by his stripes we will have spiritual healing, spiritual health. I know that it's spiritual because that's how the apostle interpreted it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he, Peter says, who, speaking of Jesus, Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So Peter uses that phrase out of Isaiah 53, and he uses it in a spiritual context of spiritual healing, not physical healing. You see sin in the Bible, particularly in the book of Isaiah, and then also in the writings of Peter is viewed as a sickness. Charles Spurgeon, I love what he said about the spiritual sickness of, of sin. He said it's hereditary, universal, contagious, defiling, incurable, and mortal. You see death ends bodily pain, but it, it's no cure for sin apart from Christ because it follows us into the next life. But it says by his stripes, by his suffering. In Hebrew, it is literally by his scars. We have spiritual healing. It's a continuous effect of the verb that is used here. Now look with me in verse number six of Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The idea of him being a substitute for us. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. Sheep easily wander off and they get lost. And that's us. Sometimes we sing the old hymn as Christians prone to wonder. Uh, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. We are like sheep. 
and we, we stray away from God. The very first step in coming to God is to admit that we have sinned. Now, really, the idea that you and I, that all of us are sinners, is probably the clearest truth that's presented anywhere in the Word of God and anywhere in humanity. That should be obvious. And yet many, many people in our culture they won't admit it. They rationalize their sin. They justify their sin. They won't admit that they have sinned. That was part one of a message entitled The Gospel in the Old Testament. So if you want to see the rest, you got to join us next week. Pastor Roger, I said this at the top. I love the Old Testament and I love how it points towards the New Testament. And one of the ways is the Messiah. Right. And you talked a little bit about that word. Can you explain Messiah a little yeah, bit more? The, the word Messiah in the Old Testament simply meant anointed one. Mm. In the New Testament, it was translated in, in to Greek, which is Christos. We, in English, it's Christ. So when we say Jesus Christ, Christ isn't his last name. <laughs> it means Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, ah. the Messiah. But it came to mean for the Jewish people a deliverer. And so they thought in terms of that someone would come that would free them from the oppression of their enemies. By New Testament time, that was the Romans. But for you and I as Christians, it's the idea of being a savior. Mm -hmm. He delivers us not from our enemies, but he delivers us from our sin mm -hmm. through forgiveness. How interesting that in Isaiah 53, they were looking to a savior and here now, present day, we can see the whole story of the Bible Absolutely. and see how much God loved us, right. that, that he had this very intrinsic, very purposeful plan with Messiah, with Christ. Um, and they had no idea. And they had no idea. Who it would be. Who it he would be. be the very son of God. It wouldn't be just a king, a descendant of David, or a deliverer, a military person. It would be the very son of hmm. God. And he would give his life for us. Right. If you're watching today um, and you have questions, there's a lot lot of information in the Bible and, and it can be overwhelming, but I encourage you to reach out. There's a website, todayswalk.org, and there are people there who would love to open up the Bible and show you how amazing this story, this King and his coming kingdom and, and the redemption right. that the Messiah Christ gives to us. You simply have to reach out. Pastor Roger, thank you so much. I am excited for part two next week. If you would like a free copy of today's message or any of the messages that we can offer, you can also visit todayswalk.org to get that. Either way, join us next week for part two as we help understand the Bible today. This has been Today's Walk. Today's Walk is the broadcast ministry of Valley Baptist Church. This program is supported directly by our church members and viewers like you. You'll find plenty of great resources when you call us or visit our website. Thank you for watching and join us again next week for Today's Walk from Valley Baptist Church in Bakersfield, California.